Our Old Testament lesson this morning is going to come from the book of Joshua. From Joshua, we're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 21 of Joshua. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Then Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly to Shittim as spies, saying, Go and view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and spent the night there. The king of Jericho was told, Some Israelites have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come only to search out our whole land. But the woman took the two men and hid them. She said, True, the men who came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when it was time to close the gate at dark, the men went out. Where the men, where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you can overtake them. She had, however, brought them up to the roof and hidden them with stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men pursued them all the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. As soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. But they went to sleep, and she came to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and the dread of you has fallen on us. And the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites beyond the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. For there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed the God in heaven, above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, Swear to me by the Lord that you will, turn, you will in turn deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters, all who belong to them, and deliver, them, deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, Our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the outer side of the city wall, and she resided within the wall itself. She said to them, go to the hill country so that your pursuers may not come upon you. Hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterwards you may go on your way. The men said to her, we will be released from this oath that you have made, that you have made us swear to you. If when we evade the land, you do not tie this crimson cord in the window through which you let us down. And you do not gather in your house all your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your family. If any of you go outdoors of your house into the streets, they shall be responsible for their own death, and we shall be innocent. But if a hand is laid upon any who are in you in the house, we will bear responsibilities to death. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be released from this oath that you made us swear to you. She said, according to your words, so be it. She sent them out, and they departed. She tied the crimson cord in the window. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, I'm going to talk about something right now that might get me in trouble. So just, just, and I'm going to talk about something right now in my sermon that I don't normally avoid talking about. But as I thought about the text today, this really was the best way I could think of to start this message. So I just want to apologize to some of you on the front end, because this may not be a particularly pleasant conversation. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Ole Miss football. I, I know for some of you, who are not Ole Miss fans, rooting for other universities, uh, this is a particularly painful subject. Likewise, for many of you who are Ole Miss fans like myself, it is an equally painful conversation. So realistically, all of you are going to be hurting as I tell this story. I was thinking that as I was reading this text this week, preparing for this sermon, about some of my favorite Ole Miss players. Uh, I, I have, I've, I've grown up watching Ole Miss my whole life. I don't really know how I became an Ole Miss fan, but uh, I am one. And I, can, I can't tell you the details of what I had for breakfast, but I can tell you all about John Darnell in the 1987 Ole Miss Independence Bowl champion Rebels with J.R. Ambrose as the star wide receiver. I can tell you all about that. So uh, it's amazing what sticks in our memory. But as I thought, as I was reading this text this week, I, it made me think about my favorite Ole Miss players. Love Deuce McAllister. When Holly and I got married, my, my cake was an Ole Miss Rebel cake, and I had, had a Deuce McAllister poster behind me on the groom's table. But, I, you know, I love Eli and Archie, as all Ole Miss fans are commanded to do. Uh, I have a lot of Patrick Willis, other great players, Michael Orr, so on and so forth. But I think... My favorite Ole Miss player, at least the last decade or two, was Dexter McCluster. I loved 
Dexter so much. I remember I went to see his first game. This is back when I was in Ripley. And um, we were all excited. We signed this great athlete out of Florida. And he was, but when he got on the field, he was so little. So little. Like he was five foot nothing, a hundred pounds. And his first year or two, every time he played, he'd get hurt. Like I remember his first couple years, years or two at all Miss, he, he just couldn't stay on the field because he was always getting hurt. But here's the thing I loved about him. He just, he just kept getting up. You'd hit him, and he'd get up. You'd hit him and you'd get up until finally, by the time he was a junior, they put him by a wide receiver and he'd get in the open field and he was impossible to tackle. He'd run, punch for touchdowns. He'd get the ball as a receiver and run for touchdowns. He was the best. But then his senior year, Ole Miss played this little bitty running back who was five foot nothing, a hundred pounds, played him at running back in the SEC where linemen are 6'7", 230. Running backs are way over 200 pounds. Quarterbacks would be 6'5", 6'6", 200-something pounds. We have this little bitty fella who's so small playing running back. But here's the thing. They couldn't tackle him. That's what I loved about him. Is here was this guy who was so little and so fast who was impossible to tackle. I remember a game, I think it was against Tennessee, where it was like watching a video game. He just, like a little water bug, he'd dart here and dart here and dart here, and they, they couldn't tackle him. And what I loved about him, I loved the way he played, I loved his aggressiveness, I loved all these things, but the thing I loved about him so much was I loved his heart. I love how hard he played the game. And I think sometimes, you know, if you could have taken his heart and put it in a bigger player, uh, oh my goodness, the player would have been literally unstoppable. But of course, here's the thing, is the bigger player would not have had to have had the heart of Dexter because he had the natural gifts and graces of height and, and size and all these type things. I think the fact that he was always so small and always so little is what made him have such tremendous heart because the only way he was going to be successful in the SEC and then the NFL was to play as hard as humanly possible. That's what I loved about him so much was how hard he played. He, just pl he played harder than any player I think I've ever seen play football. So I'll say this as an Ole Miss fan, but here's the thing. No matter what team you root for, whatever, college team or pro team or whatever sport, you're, you're a fan of. You can think of a player right now, can't you? Who was that same type player? Maybe it was, the, maybe it was the, the, the guard who was so short. Maybe it was the undersized power forward. Maybe it was, maybe it was the, 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 the first baseman who, uh, who, who always swung for the fences. Maybe, you're thinking, maybe if you're a teacher, you can think of a student who didn't come from any great advantages. And this kid just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And finally, because this kid refused to quit, became a success. I think there's something that we all admire about the individual who refuses to quit. I think there's something we all admire about the individual who maybe doesn't have natural advantages or, may, or maybe in sports is undersized or maybe, may, 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 maybe faces challenges, but they refuse to quit and they work and they try. When they, when they get knocked down, they get back up. When they fail, they try again. They constantly work and work and work and try and try and try and try. And they have a heart the size of a lion. I think we all admire that and respect that and look up to that. I know for me, as a sports fan, it's always those players like that, the ones who are undersized and a little bit too small or maybe a little too slow or maybe a little bit too whatever. But at the end of the day, they're not going to quit. They're going to keep going and going and going and going and going. And I love that. I love the players. I love the athletes. I love the individuals who there's no quit. There's no die. There's no give up. They're just going to keep going. That's why Dexter was my favorite Ole Miss player for the last 20 years because that little son of a gun, he refused to quit. And he left it all on the playing field. He, he just did it. He just wouldn't quit. I love that. 
In this series on the heroes of faith, we've been using um, Hebrews 11 as our source document, if you will. Every week we, we look at Hebrews 11 and figure out, okay, who this week are we talking about? And so we'll start with Hebrews 11, and then we'll go into the Old Testament and find the story uh, of the hero of faith listed in Hebrews 11. And this week is Rahab. This week is Rahab. And, and it's funny. Um, my Rahab sermon, this message today might be a little bit different than sermons you've heard on Rahab, because here's the thing. I mean... The typical Rahab sermon writes itself. Well, what? She was a prostitute. You know, she obviously had made some poor decisions. And even though she'd made poor decisions, she still was redeemed and faithful and becomes, uh, becomes a part of the community in the years to come after this. So, I mean, this sermon writes itself. God uses broken people. God uses imperfect people. God can take anyone's mess and anyone's life and make something beautiful out of it. But I don't want to go there and a couple of reasons why. Because I think that's, first off, that's how we always treat Rahab. We always treat Rahab in that way. We talk about the brokenness and this and that. That's one reason why I don't want to necessarily go there. But the other reason why I don't want to go there is because um, I've been doing that a lot with these previous people. I mean, think about how we talked about Joseph or, or Jacob or Israel. Next week, spoiler alert, we're talking about the book of Judges, okay? And Judges, you want to talk about imperfect people, just, just go read about Samson. That's all I'm going to say. You want to talk about imperfect, you're going to see that in all of its glory next week. We talk about Samson. But when I read Rahab's story, I wasn't struck by her imperfection or by the stuff that she did wrong or had done wrong. You know what I was struck by in Rahab's story? She did something. She didn't quit. She did something. The Israelites came to her and it would have been very easy for her to turn them in. But she didn't. She hid them. Then she lowered them down the wall. Then she made an agreement with them. She did something. By the way, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. This is why Rahab is a, is, is a hero of faith. It's really interesting. When you read the story you see her say to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that's a statement of faith. But what's very interesting is the fact that when Rahab says that, the way she says it in the Hebrew is not just that one day in the future the Lord will give you this land. But what she says here is this land is yours now. This land is yours. The Lord has already given you this land. This land is yours. We are defeated already. Even though you've not come and conquered, this land is yours. We are already defeated. We are already vanquished. This land is your land. So it's interesting, Rahab's faith was so strong in the word of God and what, what God was doing that she believed that the battle had already been won. She believed that the victory was already there. And she believed in the present reality that God's people had already won. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. She had faith, and that faith compelled her to be obedient. For Rahab, hiding the spies was not going to be the difficult choice. That was easy. The difficult choice would have been disobeying God. See, in her mind, the battle had already been won. The land was already given. It had already happened. So she had no choice but to do the right thing. She had no choice but to obey. She had no choice but to, but to live out her faith. Her faith was so strong that doing the right thing was not a challenge simply a matter of living. The danger was not in hiding the spies for her. The danger was not in hiding the spies. The danger would have been disobeying God. I heard a story one time about a preacher who was, um, this was years ago, pre-Katrina. 
He was serving at a church in Franklin, Tennessee, one of the nice suburbs of Nashville. And he felt called by God to leave behind his church there in Franklin and, and to move to New Orleans, to move to the lower ninth ward. Like I said, like I said this back pre-Katrina. And, um, and when he announced he was doing it and told his friends, told his church, they all thought he was crazy. Why would you leave this growing, vibrant community, this growing, vibrant church? Why would you leave this place here and move to a place where you're going to be in danger? Why would you take your, your wife and your children from a place where they're safe and growing and happy and prosperous to a place where they're going to be in danger? How can you do that? That's crazy. And when I heard the story, when I heard him speak, I heard him say this. He said, I told my friends that the safest place for my family to be is in the center of God's will. In other words, for this preacher, staying in Nashville outside of God's will was more dangerous than being in the lower ninth ward, not lower ninth ward in the center of God's will. For Rahab, her faith was so great in God and what God was doing that the dangerous thing was not hiding the spies. The dangerous thing would have been disobeying God. Rahab is a hero of the faith because her faith was so strong, it compelled her to act and to do something. And to do something. Our faith must compel us to act. Our faith must compel us to do something. If our faith is not calling us to do something, if our faith is not calling us to activity, if our faith is not calling us to faithfulness, then is it really even faith? Well, preacher, what if I mess up? What if I get it wrong? I mean, preacher, I'm imperfect. I can't serve. I can't do this. I can't do that because have you seen what I've done? Or, or what if I say the wrong thing or do the wrong, wrong thing? My weekly sermons are evidence that saying the wrong thing is not going to get you in trouble with God. Because y'all know I say something stupid every week. God wants us to do something, y'all. He doesn't call us to be sedentary. He doesn't call us to sit here. He calls us to do something. It's like my old coach and buddy Lonnie Schrader used to say, if you're going to make a mistake, make it at full speed. If you're going to mess up for God, mess up at full speed. Mess up doing something, trying something, working faithfully for the gospel. If you're going to mess up, mess up in that way. I think of what uh, Coach Barron used to tell us when I played football at Bogachita. He'd always say as a lineman, he'd always say, remember, boys, it ain't holding if you don't get caught. Try something. Do something. Sometimes, though, we make our faith more mental activity. Our mental exercise. Our faith is something that lives in the clouds. Not really touching our regular day-to-day -day life. I heard a story about a Wesley Foundation director walking the campus years ago with a student. And they were talking about that upcoming year as the student's senior year. And they were talking about what, what it held for their student and all these type things. And, uh, and she asked the student, she said, um, what, um, what is God calling you, to, calling you to this year? And the student, he said, um, he said uh, God's calling me to get closer to him this year. And the West Foundation director stopped and said, no, he's not. Wait, wait, what, wait, what, what? What do you mean God's not calling me to be closer to him? He said, no, that's not what God's calling you to do. God's calling you this year to forgive your enemy. God's calling you this year to read your Bible daily. God's calling you this year to go on a mission trip. God's not calling you to live your faith in the clouds that have no actual reality or no actual effect on how we live our life each day. God is not calling us to live a faith in the clouds that is untouchable, that doesn't affect how we live at Walmart or how we volunteer or how we serve or how we give 
or how we treat our spouse, how we treat our parents, how we treat our enemies, how we treat the folks that are different than we are. Our faith is not simply a mental exercise, but our faith implores us to do something. Even if we get it wrong, even if it's not perfect, even if it's messy, even if it's not right. What I love about Rahab so much was that her faith demanded that she do something. Her faith demanded that she do something. I used to have a a mentor of mine that I would meet with every few weeks when I lived in the in the Delta. He was a spiritual director. He he would give me really great advice on being a better Christian, a better pastor, and a better father and husband. And we'd end every conversation. He would say this, Andy, pray, read your Bible, and stay connected to God's people. And that's always stuck with me. Sometimes we make our faith something so ethereal, something so in the clouds, that it doesn't actually affect how we live. We need to do something, y'all. We need to be like Rahab. Our faith needs to be so real that we can't help but do something. I, I try to live with those words my friend told me. I try to pray without ceasing. I have times of prayer in the morning and times of prayer at night, but I try to take time each day in my life and pray. It's what keeps me sane. <laughs> it's what keeps me focused. When I get discouraged or angry or upset or feel unworthy, stop and pray. Are you praying? I try to read my Bible daily. That's one of the reasons why the Rooted in Christ plan matters so much to me. Because on one hand, it, it, it forces me to daily read and to learn so that I can help you. But this Rooted in Christ plan, it's a way that you can daily and pretty easily dig into God's Word. Are you reading your Bible? And, and he would say, stay connected to God's people. I, I kind of shortened that through the years to go to church. Now, going to church uh, has been difficult some these last few months, but, uh, but going to church to me is not about just sitting in these pews. But to me, going to church is about being part of the community of, community of God. Going to church means worshiping weekly. I saw a stat the other day that scared me. About 40-something percent of people right now are watching their service online, their church service. About 20% are going to another church online. About 40% of Christians aren't going, to, aren't going to church anywhere online right now. There's nothing I love. I'm so abundantly thankful to be back in the sanctuary. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm so happy on Sunday mornings to get up and go to church. But even if you aren't able to go to church, even if you aren't ready, or even if you don't feel like it's right right now to go back to church, or, or what, whatever, hear me. I'm not telling you, you got to be in church. I, I would love for everybody to be in church on Sunday, but we can't put everybody in church right now. But we have to find opportunities each week to worship, be it online. Be it listening to Caleb, I don't know. Be it listening to a sermon podcast, I don't know. But worshiping weekly. Being part of a community, a small group, whether, whether it be a Zoom Sunday school, whether it be a coworker that you talk about life with, we need some people speaking into our life. I know I've got three or four preacher buddies of mine that right now we've kept each other sane during COVID. And I'm thankful for them because they've really helped me. They've spoken into my life and I've been discouraged. They've been there for me. 
So I say being part of the community means weekly worship, weekly small group or accountability in some fashion and daily service. How are you serving people? How are you serving your family, your spouse, your children? How are you serving your coworkers? How are you serving your neighbors? How are you living out the gospel? These things here, this is a simple path. Read your Bible, pray, and be part of the church, basically. If we do those three things, I promise you, God will show up in our life and we will grow. Rahab is to be admired because her faith demanded that she do something. Today, how about us? What does our faith cause us to do? What do you do differently because you're a Christian? What do you do at all because you're a Christian? What does our faith cause us to do? Today, now, may we be like Rahab. May our faith cause us to be faithful in all things. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Rahab, for her story. God, we thank you for her faith. We thank you for her actions. Loving God, may we be much the same. May we let our faith, may, oh God, may our faith demand that we be faithful in all things, God. We love you. Give us your grace now to be that example now and always. God, give us that faith now to be that faithful. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen.